I heard something this morning that I sort of wrote down, um, <clears throat> which turns out to be um, almost like a mantra for uh, Louise Bluing's new Art Advisory Council, which is never let a crisis go to waste. Yeah, absolutely, never let a crisis go to waste. But they're thinking this way. Where's everybody else? You know. Um, and I, I, I would say. Again, I mean, you know, part of what we try to do when we write for The Voice, um, or at least part of what I try to do is to be provocative. Clearly, because it gets conversations to start. I'm not backing off from saying that I think actually sort of like a, a doing institutional critiques is, is boneheaded. I still do think it's boneheaded. And we can have that conversation. Well, but, but, but I will say this. I will say this. I do find, and I, and I think I, I tried to say it in the last piece that I wrote for The Voice, uh, is that their uh, uh, arts and labor's uh, emails, um, email campaign uh, was terrific. And the website showed a level of sophistication and a level of intelligence that I hadn't seen. And so maybe I could be convinced that I'm about it or if I don't have the, the exact dimensions of what it is that you guys are trying to do. It'd be interesting to figure out who you are. Cause, um, you know, I think we can probably, I mean, I don't know what people Scott level are introducing themselves okay. right here tonight from uh, Arts and Labor, but just one point of, like, clarification that, um, is that, you know, you mentioned the Occupy Artist Space thing in your article, and it's, it may have just been, you know, kind of lumping it in with something, but that was, a, like, an autonomous action by an artist named Georgia Sangri, Sangri who's was going to try to make it here later, but she's performing at the Whitney right now. Uh, but you know, um, you know, it's it's an important distinction to occupy museums. It's an important distinction to arts and labor. And you know, I think that's been sort of a gripe is that uh, the press coverage has been thin or inconsistent or incorrect at times. And that you know. Uh, it may mean more internally, but it starts to create this perception that it's all the same thing, and it's totally different. Yeah, that's, it also falls in the air today. Yeah. Well, Christian, one thing you just said, and we touched on it in the article, was that outside of the United States, people are doing more of what we're talking about. And you talked about one woman in Russia. Well, outside of New York, particularly. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're, we're well, the, the Astro Gates, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys are aware of what the Astro Gates is? There were other pe people that we mentioned in the article, Teresa Margoyas, who, you know, basically sort of goes out and makes art from, you know, the grime and the blood and the mud and the, and the glass and bullets and whatever uh, from actual sort of murder sites in Mexico and acquiring Mexico City and acquiring somewhere have you. Um, and I think these things are in a certain sense sort of larger than the metaphors about the death. I mean, they are that clearly, yeah? about violent death. Um, but they also, but they also, they, 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 I think they work in a way that is larger than metaphor. The, 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 the metaphor in visual arts is everything. Yeah. But, but there is a, there is, there is mobilizing function of what she does that's actually political. And I think that's new. I think that's, that's an interesting. Um, there's Tanya Bergera, who's got this immigrant movement international project in Queens, in Toronto. Um, which is essentially really an immigrant workers' party. It's a, it's a little nutty. I haven't been up there yet. But, but the idea of it is also, again, it is a metaphor, but she's out there. She's, she's really got this, uh, this community center working, empowering immigrants, generally sort of, I mean, illegal immigrants. Yeah. Um, and she means her to function as a workers' party, property, yeah? as an international sort of rallying point. I mean, for people in London, for people in Paris, for people here, you know, I don't know whether it ever sort of come together the way she wants it to, but could. Yeah. Well, Martha, you mentioned, and I told Mike when I'm on the thing, we were in the tent, and you said, shut the hell up. I think you were sitting there. And she was another example that we used in the article, if you want to talk about her a little bit, just so we can get some idea of maybe where we should be headed. Yeah. You know? Well, it's kind of awful that, um, I mean, I really have to say, my life has kind of changed after Occupy Wall Street. You know, I've spent so much time outside that when I go in galleries now, I sort of like get a weird, and I loved your review, you know, which I reviewed on the way here because I thought, you know, the first thing you ever heard of was is 
that it was kind of hard for me to even, you know, you're talking about people working out for the same thing, and so for me it's just contextual that these three women whose names I keep liking on, and luckily you chased it down for that article, which I appreciate. Um, the three, there were three feminists who won the Nobel Peace Prize. One of them had um, uh, got mobilized this group of women in sub-Saharan Africa to do a sex strike, so they wouldn't have sex with their husbands until they quit this war. And then another the one was living in a tent in uh, a refugee camp in Yemen. Um, the third one was a little bit more standard. It was, you know, she just wrote her way into the prize, basically. Right. Those types of, what I was just saying when we were talking is that those types of, I guess, what you would call interventions, um, really smack of, um, you know, social practice or early performance art or something like that. Um, it's just a question of context, and so these people are activists as, as opposed to artists. Um, and a lot of what we're seeing with the kind of Occupy Wall Street stuff, originally it was hard to kind of, um, you know, plug in artists, I'm losing black ones. Um, but in the early days, like one of the things that I was involved with was the Occupennial, which people said, oh, that was a dumb idea, I can explain more about that. <laughs> I don't think it was a dumb idea at all. I mean, we were there when there were no people there. There were like, you know, 20 people living in Zuccotti Park, and they said, okay, can you bring some people? And you're like, we in fact may know some people who may be interested in coming here by the time we got around to getting artists down there. Um, the park was totally full, and there was no way you could, you know, get other bodies in there. You mentioned those two Nobel Prize winners, and, and, and when we had a conversation, essentially what you were, what you were saying was that um, they they essentially lifted those real life lived strategies from the art performance uh, textbook. Yeah, um, and you know, and maybe those are strategies that we've forgotten to either translate to a different context. Everything that we do seems to me to be sort of, and by we, I mean people in the art community, seem to be restricted by those, those that, that precinct, the art community precinct, which is, I mean, that's really sort of the reason why I object to the idea, I mean, I don't object as in like I can't convince that it's a good idea, but I object not on principle, but on historic, as a as historical premise, as a limited historical premise that you can basically go, go that the right place to go protest is a museum. As opposed to, again, Gadozi or the auction house. You can go burn those fucking things in. <laughs> <laughs> well, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the, the museum's a place where it's been legitimized, and, you know, it's, you know, the museum's a good place. It's, you know, the perception is that it's where you get culture. And it's, but it's been constructed around wealth. And I mean, I know Marthy could probably talk about this a little bit further, but the, the museum, it seems like this expression, physical expression of wealth and power. And that the, more than the auction houses and more than the goes. The, I mean, the auction the, the house doesn't have a public, it doesn't have a public mission. I'm sorry, I, no. Go ahead. Um, well, th there's been protests at Sotheby's early in the fall. And Sotheby's was kind of like this monolith that couldn't budge an inch. Um, and then, and then uh, protests started happening in MoMA, which of course has Danny Meyer sitting on the board. He also owns restaurants there, and um, he's on the board at Sotheby's. So, so that's where there's like a connection being made to like go there and make some noise, make it uncomfortable for the museum, try to pressure them to like get Danny Meyer to step up, say something. It's not, it's not just like. Uh, like some random. No, I get that. I get that. But, but you know, again, I, part of my objection is the fact that these are the these are the ones these are the one institutions um, in in our community that happen to be fairly transparent and have some level of accountability. Um, you didn't necessarily go in to sort of make a larger critique of what Sotheby's does. You you went to talk about what they've done to the art members, which is great. I, I but, okay. Well, whoever did. But it seems to me that the larger critique is absolutely necessary. You know. Yeah, but I think when you get to that larger critique, you're still dealing with the same people who shop at Sotheby's and then are on the boards and the trustees at the Whitney, at the Guggenheim. I mean, you know, David Gannick, who ran Level Global, his logo was designed by Ed Roche, uh, shut down his head fund recently because he was being investigated by the feds. And he was on a uh, trustee at the Guggenheim and, you know, sort of pointed out uh, by Andrew Frazier recently, and this is something that 
and sort of following in my own personal way since he strung darn the painting out of me a couple of years ago. But, um, you know, I think there is an immediate overlap between the two things, and I think, you know, part of my own unease about calling for an end to the Whitney is it's, it, it also says stop showing art in my mind. I know it may not be stop showing art, but it's stop showing art here or stop participating here. Um, and I know Jen, you talked a little bit about that. I mean, uh, I think it's, I think it's interesting to talk about museums and high culture as the way it's used as a sort of money, money laundering thing. It's a way to legitimize very nasty people and money that they have. And to me, that's one of the interesting things to talk about is you may be someone who's an oligarch who should probably be in jail for what you did to your country, but we're thrilled to have you, you know, on our Hey, well, and if you look at the sponsorship page, which one of the young organizers did for the Whitney, you know, it keeps talking about, we can help your brand. So it's very much like, just go look on the Whitney website, sponsorship, here's what you get, you know, and it's like a package. You know? Is it Deutsche Bank? It's a, they're the major ones. And they were a major part of the subprime mortgage crisis. Yeah. That was exactly. UBS helps many, many rich art clients keep their money safely in Switzerland. They and, and, and if anyone feels like speaking, please do speak up. Feel free to kind of interrupt if you feel the need to. Um, there's not really a way to call on hand. At an OWS meeting or General Assembly, there would be a progressive stack where new voices would be um, privileged and people haven't spoken yet. You know. So feel free to weigh in, <coughs> James. I, I just think if you're, I can attack the federal government without thinking it shouldn't exist. I can attack the museum without thinking it shouldn't exist. I think we have to understand that's what we're yeah, no, and although maybe some people don't think they should say. Yeah, I think again, one main objection is that if we basically if we if we draw the circle around the art community as the one place where we do politics, then we might also be restricted to that place as the place where we do politics. And that might be a significant point of relevance as opposed to elsewhere. And and, and I think that's important to consider. Because I think artists have the possibility, largely because we do this we do this. I'm looking for myself and just an artist. Um, artists do this thing, which is, which has this great area of freedom and a great area of imagination that I think what we're trying to say is somewhat outside. Right? It's been a few creative speaking. And so you can see around curves, but those curves hopefully are not just for the art community, they're for sort of society at large. Again, we're kind of mention some of the other days. So if we're drawing a line around our, 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 our place of relevance, and that continues to be the art community, then we're going to get art community politics, not politics per se. And I think what we should be arguing for is politics the capital T. Yeah. Hasn't the art community always had this kind of, for lack of a better word, complicated relationship with the power elite of whatever culture it's in? I mean, how throughout history, Art, great works yeah. of art commissioned by royalty, by the church, and like, today it's hedge funds who are on the boards of museums. I understand that, and yet that's always, it's, it does sound like a justification and then an excuse, and it's phenomenological. It's like this has always happened, but it didn't happen before that. You know, I mean, the Medici's, you know, sort of, it, this became part of the new culture, you know, moving from a feudal system to a market economy, a trading economy, you know, the bourgeoisie in France. I mean, this is, you know, been established over a long period of time, but it hasn't always been this way, and it doesn't have to remain that way if people don't want it to. But, but, but the places where there was that, I mean, if we look at two places where political art in the last century completely took over countries, was in the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. Now that was, in both cases, top down, but it was the art world was also in service of politics and the of the state. Mexico during the revolution. Right, those are the two that stand out, the shiny yeah. But You know, in, in, in a way that's not fascist necessarily, it's more about the plutocracy, is that when Dacus, you know, the New Museum debuted that, you know, brought up that model, it was a new direction for culture. It was just not the direction that I'd like to see. Yeah, it's wrong. Yeah. Well, and and she pointed, Martha pointed out in our article that here, as, as uh, James pointed out, we can complain about the government, we can complain about MoMA, and no one's going to shoot us as opposed to what's been happening to um, um, but, but, but it seems to me, there you go. Mm -hmm. But to say, it seems to be disingenuous for us to be cycling through history. Mm -hmm. When we've got, again, examples that are sitting right in front of us, stuff that's happening right this minute. I went away, I went away as the guy. 
you know, I will lay sort of a shiny example of what a single guy can do by being by, by having a practice. And we're talking about a large practice, yeah? Yeah. It includes blogs and all kinds of stuff. But the arrow will put it at the top of the power 100. Yeah. And, and yeah. Come on, how do you do what I write for you? Put it up there. That, that's, all right. Can we just say that that just signals one of the joke. tensions? But one of the tensions, clearly, though, is that you have a lot of artists doing things independently, and OWS and the working groups are collective, and that does cause a tension, I think, between artists who are trained to work in their studios, work independently, trying to get involved in solidarity around something. You know? All I'm trying to point to, with out of the way, is the, power, the symbolic power that Martha had mentioned before of, of Art of an artist currently, you know. I mean, I understand the problems with the cult of personality, which, you know, um, yet, and I'm not even necessarily saying it's a transferable model if it is a model, but the fact that you have this guy doing this, and we have these instances where essentially Nobel Prize winners are changing, are changing actual politics in countries where they need changing by adopting art performance tactics tells us that the elements are there. Yeah? Well, the other thing I was going to say, sitting here looking at your drawings, because I remember one No, they're mine. They're not mine. They're not mine. Okay. Okay. No, this is not. <laughs> 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 we draw people from time to time. But <laughs> this is how they're artists. Uh, that doesn't look like yours, but a couple of them do. Pretty nice physical that. line in the room, though. But, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't um, say which side was which. Side. Yeah. Well, sorry. <laughs> that might be a huge insult. That's our my drawings. Um, at any rate, I was, cause I was writing about an um, artist named Rumor Cardillo, who was from um, Uruguay in the late 60s, early 70s, which was under a military government. They shut down the art school because that was the hotbed of you know, activism, etc. And um, everybody moved their, whatever their skill was, into these, basically into their garage, and they would have these kind of workshops. But then one of the things that they did is they would have these print clubs, and um, you know then yeah you know, prints are obviously cheaper, you know they're easier to produce, but we, well not produce but reproduce at least, and uh, disseminate. And it was a way of trying to get around what you were talking about in terms of patronage. Our lockdown over the last, and, and of course the biennial, you know, was not the biennial until 1973. It was annuals that were painting and sculpture. So right there, it wasn't photography, it wasn't anything, it wasn't performance, it wasn't video. Take turns. Yeah, and between the two primary mediums that need, you know, that kind of funding, and the one that really needs funding is sculpture, you know, because in the old days, you know, it was, you know, bronze or marble or whatever, the materials themselves were incredibly expensive. So that's what's sort of interesting with your work, too, is that already it's going into those areas where, um, you know, theoretically it doesn't have to be funded by, for lack of a better term, or any favorite term, the 1%. You know, but Paper and pencil. Yeah. yeah. So part of it is just kind of getting around those forms. And that's in the 60s. I mean, part of what Occupy Wall Street is, you know, people are like, oh, people are fetishizing the 60s. Well, that was a moment when there was a kind of breath of fresh air. People got really excited. And the what book you do? OK, we can do performance. We can do these things that are not going to be easily commodifiable. And, and now, unfortunately, we sort of got back into the hole again. So. Well, now we can sell on in. You know it. I mean, I'd love to hear from, I mean, please, you know, like, it's uh, a really open discussion at this point, so if anyone has anything they want to respond to, please do, and jump in and interrupt our power people. So it's not for a meeting, but... No, I didn't, it's not to set them up for a meeting. That doesn't make sense. Exactly. But I mean, this is, you know, like... No one who's ever worked in the world. My opinion that <clears throat> Occupy Wall Street was the purest version of relational aesthetics there could be because it was all these people coming together, there was no centralized idea, it kind of morphed. And I thought it was ironic that performa was happening right at that point. And uh, so I, I, I admit though, I, I completely avoided it. I just thought it was really contradictory. Performing. Uh, <laughs> really <laughs> well, perform has its own issues. Yeah. <laughs> per, per, perform, I could go on and on, but Occupy Wall Street, I, I definitely would. 
I mean, do you feel like uh, sympathetic to what's going on or what you know about it, or do you feel like you know much about the working groups or what's the kind of work that's been happening since September and October? Um, you know, I, I, I would like to say that I do. I, I've, I've been sort of studying up, studying up on the financial crisis and all of this. Um, my whole idea, though, was that they should have been uptown. They should have been outside of you know, city groups building. You know, they should have been. Um, you know, they weren't even in front of the stock exchange. You know, um, and, and yet, I mean, they have created a national dialogue. Let's forget about art. The national dialogue they've created is impressive. I mean, that I can buy my 80-year-old father a T-shirt that says "We are 99 percent." And he says, yeah, this is great. And that my old man's probably going to vote for a black guy the first time in his life is just, I mean, and it's partly because of, of the dialogue that they've created. They have completely outshouted the Tea Party, which did their own, they, what they did in 2010 is frightening. So I think Occupy Wall Street, forget this art discussion, a lot of props for starting this conversation. It's, it's astonishing. And they move the discussion back towards the center because it's so far to the right. I, I, yeah. Just a point of clarification: that it was interesting that the artists in the first before the occupation were amongst the few like tricksters who were uh, testing ground in front of uh, Wall Street in the heart of it and pushing buttons like doing yoga and doing just shout outs and, and all this kind of stuff. So and, and several of them got arrested. So they were, they were they were actually all testing that, and it was artists and doing their own kind of testing, I guess. So. Well, to, to pick up on that, I mean, the reason they ended up in Zuccotti Red right, because uh, there weren't any private places where they could set up shop and start um, a, a kind of long-term protest like that. And so we're talking about to you know relating this back to why maybe museums are a relevant object of critique, like. If you're, if you know, part of the point of being at Zuccotti is to point out that there aren't places of public protest in New York. There isn't a place to make those kinds of statements and put those that kind of political pressure on on people in a public way, um, especially in Bloomberg, New York. Right, and so if we're talking about holding museums to the kind of kind of standards that we would, uh, you know, or to the mission that we would like to hold them to, then maybe museums are one of those, you know few places that have, in addition to places of public protest, that have this kind of public mission related to speech. I think, if, 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 if I'm going to follow up, I think that there's lots of justifications as to why it ended up where it was, but I think that what um, millennials in particular should do is start up something about along the lines of what you're discussing which is just a little bit more concrete um, and something that's a little bit more um, useful. You know, uh, in, we watched this movie, Inside Job, about the financial crisis last night. And uh, in that, uh, the guy says, why does a, uh, a financial engineer make 10 times more than a real engineer? Somebody who's out making roads. And then also to follow up on that, I think that the protest in, I forget which auction house it was, but the orgy of the rich, the sort of people, they sort of held up this sign and they started screaming at Christie's. I like, I prefer that. <laughs> I mean, it seems to the actions that some of the things have started to happen. Um, so the situational type stunts. And the, the museum too is a place where, I mean, like you said, where people who are, have no money and people who have much more money will cross the same floor. And I think if you're trying to ask for social responsibility with money, it's a good place to be to ask for that. And there's not that many places that are like that. I and mean, we can't go into a lot of, you know, corporate headquarters. Which, you know, we don't have access to that. The museum we have access to, plus we have, we're still crossing that well, same floor that everyone else is. That's the reason you have the access, because they're actually sort of, their politics are such that they can't be the people save significant things. I mean, they would risk significant things, I think, mean, um, by calling the cops first time out. But there are sidewalks in front of the city, and there's sidewalks in front of South Beach, and there's sidewalks in front of the... I think that's different, the, though. I feel like there's I, a big difference between being on the sidewalk protesting and being inside a space. 
my main problem with going to art institutions of protest. I, I can, there's this distinction between strategies and tactics. I can accept it as a tactic, but as a strategy, as, a, as an overall vision of what the politics should be, I have a big problem. I could be, I could be. Do you feel like an alien? No, it just short changes it. It short changes the entire project. It makes it a small P politics, not a large P politics. That's my problem. Can you explain why? Because that, that's the second time you said that. Because I think if we basically, if the remit for the political activity is the arts community, it's not big enough. If the remit is larger, if you go in and you say, right, look, this is a nexus of power and money and influence, and also of aesthetics and all this other stuff. Oh, and so we're, and like, you, like the two of you are saying, and this is a place where we can actually get away with walking in and doing something. They're not going to take us out the first time. They're going to let us sort of like, and we're going to be able to sort of do our thing. Yeah? Uh, we're going to be able to channel it. Um, if, you, if, if, you can, if you can be looking to create a larger politics, not just an art world politics, then I'm all for it. I'm all good. But that has not been the history of institutional critique. And what I don't, what I, I think would be really a shame is if this movement basically channels itself through the same com through the same historical channels that that uh, that got free Fridays, which is great, but it's just free Fridays. It's target free Fridays. But, you know, now it's target free Fridays. Protests are about bigger issues than than art. But I think uh, that's what I'm saying. I agree mm -hmm. with you, and yeah. I think that's what people are doing. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that yeah, I when well, you're saying the artists are getting out of their studios, not, they're just not worrying about it. They're mm -hmm. not worrying about the difference between what they're doing in their studio or what they're doing when they're meeting, as much as I remember in the past. And more people are actually getting more involved. And Back in my youth, I was involved with Teamsters, and one of the best groups. I'm glad you see that because I don't. I mean, that that's kind of why I'm here because I don't see that. I don't see that being sort of anywhere near the norm in terms of what artists do in, in, in the city. Uh, it's not. Is no, I, I don't know if that's the norm, but I'm seeing it more. And I think of the artists who are involved, um, I don't think that they're, they're, thinking they're involved too many in projects. Not. They're involved, you know, uh, there, as the, everyone is. But the whole point of sort of us sitting around talking through this as a, a, as a potential art project, is it's a community particularly with particular skills that can bring those particular skills <coughs> to a uh, given context, a given political context. And the point, or at least my point would be, is that that's, those skills are being underused um, and, and under -imagined. And that's a problem. You know, this, it can make politics better, frankly, if you can think, if you can find it a situation like art where, um, where again, I, I, I think you can, you can imagine, I mean, you can really get, I think, ahead of the curve, frankly. Um, uh, and I don't, yeah, I just don't see that happening. Well, okay. The thing I would say about Occupy, though, is um, because you were talking about it as a kind of physical space, and they, which I thought was interesting because you kept saying they, which makes me sound like maybe you're confining it to the people who are actually living in the park, I'm not quite sure. But, um, it was very vague, but the thing that it was vague enough is to serve as an umbrella so that you started having everybody realize it was a space of possibility to talk about what was wrong in terms of collusion, corruption, etc. within your individual world. So that, in, you know, right away you had like Occupy Banking, Occupy, you know, with a group down there saying let's talk, you know, people who were in finance or, you know, academics and economics or whatever who, who knew what was going on. Um, and within the art world, just to go back to protesting in museums, um, I mean, part of what, you know, the last, the sort of neoliberalism, and particularly the kind of conservative push, is to get rid of expertise. You know, like, we don't need those stupid experts. But the fact of the matter is, um, the market knows that. Yeah, I mean, that was a sort of Bush thing. Like, I'm not an expert. It's like, you know, you certainly are not. Um, but the fact is, you know, and I hate to say I'm an expert, it's really just that I have been doing this for a really long time. Um, you know, I took, I, I've been making art my whole life, and I took my first art history class like, when I was 16. So I've been sort of like studying this for a long time. And so last night when someone asked me, well, what's wrong with museums? I don't get it. Because they do, partly because of the sponsorship, have this veneer of being these benevolent institutions. And I said, well, you know, survey 
museums started with like the Napoleonic invasions. The whole point was you go to Egypt, you go to these places, you get all the booty, you bring it back to Paris, you parade it through the streets in carts, showing people this is what your war dollars are paying for, tigers, lions, you know, an obelisk, and then you put it, and then you put it in the Louvre, you know, that's a survey museum. And, um, you know, the Met, I mean, if you want, I think Andrea Frazier's um, museum highlights, which is actually installed in the Met right now in a very sort of provocative location um, in the 19th century galleries, you can go and watch that video, and it is institutional critique that has been sort of reabsorbed, but because it was funded by museums, you know, and that was the thing that you had um, institutional critique artists, more like Ben Kinmont, not as well known because they were working outside of museums, um, and really trying to avoid, you know, opening bookstores or things like that, really trying to avoid um, being um, reabsorbed into the institution. <coughs> the last thing I'll say, though, with the Occupy movement is having seen a couple of protests, it's amazing how excited people are that, you know, they see this Occupy banner come out and they're like, it's like the hero has arrived. Like, you're here, thank you, inside the museum shouting. People really like it, you know, and it's very similar for instance, when you know the NAACP came into existence, and something would happen, it would say, "What does the NAACP think about this?" You know, and this has become, and I've sort of seen it with the biennial as a sort of test case. It's sort of amazing how much um, that arts and labor got this letter um, into, like you're. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Uh, you know, honestly, I, I, and I thought that was, you know, I. I didn't get to enjoy um, time spent with, uh, with Occupy Wall Street Market because I was over in Dublin basically putting together a biennial letter in politics. Um, so when I got back, it was there. Um, and um, it, it, it does strike me that, that these last instances of activity have been, I find, very bright. And I think. Um, uh, all your wealth, um, and, uh, and it's, it's weird to me that actually I, I don't know who's here from the Arts and Labor Group. It'd be great if I did somehow, but uh, yes, you you're, you're out and you can sell it. You can see that. I, you know, I think that's open to anyone who wants to because you know I know you have to leave in a couple of minutes, Christian, um, and I'd like the discussion to continue. We have the space still. Um, around nine or a little bit later. Um, and it doesn't have to be sitting in chairs. We could disperse and talk and drink some more beer, um, whatever. But, you know, I, it's really up to the members. I mean, I've, I've attended five or six arts and labor meetings myself. Like, and I just, you know, I feel like I'm learning about it. And it, it's a different thing than reading about it or talking about it and going and kind of being active, even if I haven't like done an action yet. Yeah, it'd be nice to talk to some of the directors about the circle of time to, to, to you know, see them. But, but in any event, what I was going to say is that these last developments I find very encouraging. And I find it particularly encouraging in that way, as I was mentioning with different tactical The new, I think I'm reading, for example, the, the uh, I'm, I'm personally not reading the, um, Call off the Whitney Biennial 2014 literature. I'm, I'm, I'm reading it as a, as a tactic. Um, uh, whether it is or it isn't, it, it, it's open to that uh, reading. And, and I think you know what they've done is, is they've really sort of mobilized thought about what's it mean? What's um, it whether it exists or whether, I mean, what's it mean that you have the Whitney Biennial? Who's it served? What purpose? And it's up a piece with your Damien Hurst, which is so interesting. You're not really, I mean, Damien <laughs> <laughs> So it's the same, but it's a very interesting thing, like it, like the obituary and the end of the so. That's true. Because you could have written a, you know, satirical, you know, uh, sure. obituary for the Whitney Biennial and have died along with this wealth, the mass wealth of power. Yeah, my career has been very active. Two in a row. Yeah. Two obituaries in a row. Can't do it. No. I think, I think I find it interesting how William keeps saying, like, oh, he's been to five meetings, so it's, it's, it's and then, then someone's, like, asking who, who are these members, but in actuality, like, not, William might be, he might not be, he doesn't know, like, 
we this we might be part of it now because we're in this meeting. Like, there's no certification or kind of like system to identify this, which I think is quite interesting and kind of quite strong in some ways. So if you've been there once, are you like 10% arts labor? <laughs> and you've been to a, a education and empowerment, are you 50% education and empowerment? Or are you, like it's, you it's kind of like, yeah, I've been to quite, quite a lot of meetings in, all over in all the working groups and stuff. Okay. I mean, but honestly, I'd like to attend meetings. This is part of the reason I'm asking for some point of identification. I need to be able to talk to somebody. Uh, I've been to a couple meetings. Yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to say about um, the, 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 the ten, uh, tension between like tactics and strategy is I do, I, and I, I don't know, like I, I've participated in meetings in arts and labor and Occupy Museums and 814 Plus Brigades and a couple other meetings. Uh, and and, and I, I don't see like any, there's no sort of like, um, overarching uh, set of like, like there's no grand strategy that I'm aware of. Maybe if somebody is, they could correct me, but, but I do see like the working groups is kind of working independently and together with other working groups. And they're like these tactical things that happen in each, um, like there's kind of working groups for each sort of professional community in the city. And the, the working groups go back into their professional community and sort of work on that and come back together for a larger meeting. Um, as you're talking, it seems to me possible to define OWS in general as more tactics than strategy, per se. Um, that's not to say that if there isn't a strategy, it's probably the weakest point. Well, there, 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 are, there are specific groups dedicated to strategy, and I don't want to name them. Um, but it's also like the, the list, uh, like early in the fall, there was like everybody wanted to occupy Wall Street to have a list of demands. And the problem with demands is like if, if you list demands, then it becomes a, a movement about gaining concessions. And I think, I think, uh, I can't speak for the movement, but what I've picked up on is there seems to be a desire for uh, tra transformation and not just concessions. And that's great. Yeah, and uh, I think I think I see the work. All the working groups I participated in are there's there's a kind of motivation towards that, not just to, not just to improve things, but to change things completely. Yeah, I forget who it was that said what was saying. It may very well be that the, you know OWSs are either way. You know. Um, I think one of the interesting things in, in thinking about strategy and tactics is that if you really think about capitalism, it's not a strategy. It's a tactic. You're right. I mean, it's it's a it is tactics writ large, and so in a in a sense, I mean, I thought that was what was fundamentally so powerful about the Occupy Wall Street was the refusal to. Um, talk about um, goals because then you're talking about strategy, and this was a, you know we are in a uh, you know we're in a street fight, and you know it ain't pretty, and it's you know it you know and I don't know where it goes from there. I think you know for me um, being you know a supporter of the art world rather than being an artist. You know, being an artist, it is a, um, you know, I, I, like, I, I don't like this idea that these, you know, these women who were, you know, um, putting their, you know, putting their asses on the line, um, somehow get trivialized as being performance artists. I mean, to me, I mean, and that's, you know, that says volumes about, you know, where, you know, where I'm, how I think and how I see things. You mean, but I, 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 I see that, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see, you know, I, I think it's the, you know, getting into the soul of that, of that person. Um, I, I, I can't imagine um, being in a, in, a, in a refugee camp somewhere uh, where, you know, my, my world is, is torn apart by, by warfare, and the only thing I've got is to, uh, is, is, you know, sort 
sort of the most basic biological weapon that I've got. That to me is, I, I can't even see that as, as sort of as being an artistic we didn't say that, but the thing is that it say even you know in the early 20th century, art was seen as a sort of utopian model. You know that like what could possibly get us out of you know whatever whatever mess it was. Mm -hmm. And art is not currently seen as a utopian model. However, those sorts of strategies, as we were saying, are something. And and how Christian framed it, borrowed from you know the sort of imaginative realm of. Of art, not necessarily. It doesn't always have to be art, but the point is, I think instead of people being inspired by art, oh, we're going to go and do this, that it, it's sort of working the other way around. The other thing we had, I mean, we had about an hour and a half long discussion that had to be edited down into a tiny little thing. So, the other two examples that I was thinking about recently is that when you really are, like you're saying, in a refugee camp, that's about as bad as it can get. But a couple of other. Um, instances where, for instance, in, um, uh, uh, in Tirana, Albania, where you know everything was so bad, they basically got an artist for a mayor, and he painted all the buildings, you know, these bright colors. It's a pretty well known thing. It's about ten years old, but it was an artistic way of, you know, when everything is just completely collapsed in terms of infrastructure that you just use color and then people started coming just to see this whole thing. And then the only other one I'll say is that in Bogota they had a mayor who was actually not an artist but he was, you know, sort of a free thinking intellectual, and intellectual right. who they had a really big problem with police corruption in the street, just the traffic cops, and so they got um, mimes to come and be the traffic cops because then you couldn't speak and then it would just be people sort of Whatever, again, a very sort of artistic way of thinking around a really serious, you know, violence, corruption, like art, etc. Artist, artist potential paradigm shift. But, you know, yeah, that's really one, one thing that, you know, when um, the Occupy, when the, the camp was sort of taken down and the tents were removed, um, I, I've been thinking about Ben Davis and his 9.5 theses on art class said, you know, art is just, you know, can just become a pressure release valve and, you know, let the steam out of all the problems and that's what its role is and that it doesn't have this symbolic power in some way. And I thought when they took down the, the, the tents in Zuccotti Park, that it just, I realized how powerful of a symbolic container that was, mm -hmm. you know, it, as like a piece of sculpture, as a piece of something where people could put everything that they were thinking about and have like this visual, mental, physical space mm -hmm. to kind of contain something that had already become so diffused. It, it's much harder to conceptualize these networks, you know, people working independently. I mean, I think that whole camp, that was, as you said, that was a tactic rather than a strategy, right? That became, that camp itself became a thing. It wasn't talked about in kind of group or gang. Like it, it used the tactics of sort of this idealized version of how we would, you know, we project what we want to see. But I think to Christian's point, people do have to think about strategies, what you said, capitalism is just one big tactic, the king hell tactic of all time. But by the same token, if we think of the 2004 Republican Convention here in New York, that was an incredible piece, piece of performance arts. It was, it was a tactic at stra strategic level because they brought, they turned what most New Yorkers, I would say 90% of New Yorkers felt on its head. And I do think that an outfit like Occupy Wall Street has to be aware of that bigger picture because simply through what they did, through the sheer ferociousness of it, they got into America's conscious, consciousness. But they need to keep that kind of force going forward. I was very excited to go down to about Occupy before it happened. I guess days before I heard from you. I went down the first morning after they arrived at Zuccotti and I was already excited and I saw I think it was that morning, it might have been the next day, they already had something called Arts and Culture Working Group. And I thought, wow, this is really great. My activism ballooned with ACTA. Mm -hmm. And I was very active in ZAP, one of the affinity groups doing ZAPs, which involved basically street theater, or inside museum theater for that matter, that sort of thing. And I, since the beginning of Occupy, I've been somewhat disappointed by the lack of that kind of energy, artistic energy, which wasn't always done by artists, but by people who were really, uh, whether it was just doing, doing designs like uh, Grand Fury, very professional, but it didn't have to be professional, people who really could get involved in this and weren't doing it in very professional reasons. Well, and the really curious thing about Grand Fury 
curious that those billboards were funded by the Whitney, you know, a couple of them, yeah. and, then, and then they were in the Venice BMI, and now the institutions themselves have become sort of like, it's more contentious as well, you know, 20 years on. But, you know. but I'd like to see more visible involvement by artists, or people who perform as artists, or really consider themselves. And a lot of it is very imaginative and looks great, what's happened so far. Point of information, um, I, I know for a fact, well, I've heard uh, that there, there is going to be a lot more kind of theatrical energy coming in the spring. There's going to be a lot of activity coming in the spring. And I, I, I would encourage people to, uh, to get involved with it. And instead of just desiring, you know, yeah. wishing for something to be there to kind of put your foot in it and contribute to that and make it happen.